Hi, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. My name is Isabel Ross, and I am the coach at Peak Endurance Coaching. Episode 72 is an interview with Julie Emmerman. Dr. Julie Emmerman is a sports psychologist who currently works with numerous individuals on men and women's world tour pro cycling teams, is a contract employee with USA Cycling's high performance division, and provides consultation with team directors. Julie also worked with Garmin Slipstream Pro Tour team from 2008 to 2010, one of the team's most successful periods to date. In addition to cycling, her clientele includes NHL, track and field Olympians, professional triathlon, golf and MMA. She is passionate about being able to play a role in the professional and personal lives of so many. <clears throat> Julie herself is also a highly accomplished athlete. In 2019, she took eighth in the US Pro Women's Time Trial. In 2018, she won silver at the Master Track National Championships. She is also the current American and national record holder for the Masters Time Trial. I chat with Julie about how to deal with the prolonged lockdown happening in Melbourne, but also how to deal with the general anxiety around COVID. We also talk about racing and running as well, so and also how to deal with racing anxiety. Can I ask you a favour? Would you be able to go on over to Apple Podcasts to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast? I don't get paid to do this. I do it for the love of sharing great stories and information, but would really, truly appreciate your support and reviews. It makes it all feel worthwhile. Navigating COVID is a lot like trying to get to the end of an ultra. It takes focus and a positive mindset. We can see a sports psychologist to help with this mindset, but who can help us when our injuries or niggles are holding us back? Well, the specialists at health and high performance are here to help, and they can do that as they utilize the latest in technology and experience to help you run your best. So head to healthhp.com.au forward slash run or find them on Instagram, health high performance. In spite of everything feeling out of control in this time of COVID, you are actually within yourself in a position of power and how you react to this rather crappy and horrible situation. As they always say, control the controllables and focus on the future. And you can do this in your running with a structured and well-planned training program with Peak Endurance Coaching. Email me, isabel at peakendurancecoaching.com.au and let's get your training moving in the right direction. Enjoy the interview with Julie. Hi, Julie, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, can you tell the listeners a bit about yourself and how you got into sports psychology? Sure. Um, I started off getting my degree in clinical psychology, and then I sort of detoured and had an incidental career as a professional cyclist. Um, But I enjoyed that so much, and it was worthwhile for me to literally put my academic uh, degree on hold for a little bit and race professionally. So I did that, and then I finished my degree, started working, um, and then I was hired by some professional sports teams to work with them realized through that um, there were a few variables involved, but I realized I really missed racing myself. And so from that point forward, I decided to balance a private practice in sports psychology. I I re-specialized in sports psychology to to carry that forward. And then I also got back into racing and instead of mountain bike racing, which was my original sport, I got into road cycling and um, then had actually a more successful career as a road cyclist than I had in mountain bike racing, even, you know, I'm proud of both, but, um, the road, my road cycling career actually was, was, uh, quite satisfying. So that's what I've been doing. And, um, as far as my professional life as a sports psychologist, I work with all elite professional Olympic level athletes in my private practice. Um, and I'm in, I'm based in Boulder, Colorado. So oh. Beautiful spot. That's a little bit about me. Yeah. Thank <laughs> it you. It is a nice spot. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as we were discussing earlier, uh, Melbourne uh, in Australia is, you know, in the middle of a very extreme lockdown, um, which has been in place for over three months, and we've been in in lockdown basically since March, and it's now um, mid October. 
um, and and it has the feeling of it will never end. And and you know, similarly in ultra running, when we get to the end, towards the end of a hundred mile or two hundred mile or hundred k, whatever it is, it feels really hard. And sometimes, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, and I'm sure other runners feel the same. It feels like it will never end, and um, and and you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm just wondering how we can um, sort of. Is there some sort of strategies we can do to help us deal with mm -hmm. these kinds of situations that feel like they're never going to end so that we don't fall into a, a really bad place? Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent question. And um, as I think about it, I mean, first off, let me just say that it's really normal throughout this extended period of time when people are dealing with the pandemic to have highs and lows Sometimes people will feel completely committed to following the rules and doing everything you're supposed to do for a while. But then because there is no end in sight, it's also very natural for people to then, the same people to experience the opposite where you feel rebellious and you just want to say, oh, I'm done with this. I can't deal with it anymore. And you may or may not act that out in literal terms, whether you you know decide to go beyond the 5K perimeter of your home or not. Um, you know, Maybe some are, maybe some aren't taking that, that risk. But the feeling about it is the same where people will lose their commitment to following the rules because they don't know when this is going to end. So I mentioned that because in that way, it's really different than an ultra race of any kind, because even though in an ultra race, you may feel like it's never going to end, you actually cognitively know that it does end. And so there's different tactics you can use psychologically when you know there is an end point, but you just feel like it's never going to come. Um, we can approach that differently from a sports psychology vantage point than say this pandemic, which truly we do not know um, when it's going to end. And, and that brings up a complete sense of uncertainty, so much ambiguity, um, lots of doubts um, mixed then with alternating periods of hope, depending on what the science is telling us. And so in some ways they're, they, you know, there are some similar feelings, but they're also very distinctly different because of those endpoints, one being known and one being unknown. Yeah, no, and that's and that's a, a fair point. So, um, so for this situation where it feels like um, there is, you know, no end, what what can we do to help us mm -hmm. navigate that? Well, I think first and foremost, it's really important to normalize the feelings that come with the sense of dread and loss that and anger that comes from being in the situation for now seven plus months. Um, it's really hard for people to reconcile sometimes the feelings of just what all of this is. And I think um, internationally, we are all mourning. We're all in a state of grieve, uh, grieving around people that we've lost, experiences that we've lost, jobs that we've lost, um, you know, relationships that are not able to survive because we can't see each other and so on and so forth. So I, I do think that First, we have to just be able to tag what is going on for us emotionally as we experience all this and normalize it, and then be able to check in with ourselves and ask ourselves, okay, what are the things that can help me during these times? Whether that means really being creative in how you are using your time and trying to reach out to people or stay connected with people, being creative with how you try to stay fit and exercise as you're able to, um, being creative with how you're going to maybe shift your goals when it comes to say competing or tackling certain projects based on what's realistic for us given these times um so it is a lot of it's a combination of sort of surrendering or suspending um let me slow myself down Surre surrendering on the one hand to what is in terms of all the uncertainty that is surrounding us and then also saying okay i don't have control over so much that's going on right now and in truth you never really, we never really have that much control, but now it's in our faces more than ever. And now what do I feel like I can control? Where can I assert some self-agency? Where can I start something and see it through to an end? Just to give ourselves that sense of purpose, a sense of um, satisfaction, completion, being goal-oriented, you know, if, if you can see something through to the end it's always a good feeling um, and hopefully people are enjoying that process in the middle of, uh, you know, on their way to accomplishing something. And even if it's like doing a puzzle with your family members, it doesn't really matter what it is, but just trying to um, 
set up for yourself a type of schedule and then within that schedule, what are the things that you want to do? How can you accomplish those things? And just trying to control for those things as best you can. So, so you, those are some things to, to do. Yeah. You spoke about normalizing feelings. What does that, what does that mean? And how, how do we normalize feelings? Um, normalizing feelings means first and foremost, not um, judging ourselves for the things that we feel in any given minute, day or hour. Um, so some days, like I was saying earlier, an individual may feel like perfectly at peace with what's going on. And it's, you know, nothing certainly gets like triggered in a day. Um, but then maybe something happens and someone feels completely angry or just frustrated with the situation um, of the pandemic. Normalizing means making room for all those feelings and not judging any one of them necessarily as bad or good. They just are. And what we know about feelings is that they always pass, they come and go. Um, and so it's important not to allow ourselves to indulge too much in any one particular feeling because that doesn't serve us. We need to recognize that feelings can be extremely intense, but they will pass. And usually you can tease out some things that are helpful about that feeling and what it's trying to communicate to you that would then help you take those next steps. Um, so normalizing it not to not to get too much off the point but normalizing those things makes means making room for those feelings without judging them necessarily bad or good or shunning yourself because you shouldn't think that or you shouldn't feel that um normalizing it just means these are really really hard times and so it may feel uncomfortable to recognize that you feel certain things you're not used to feeling um but it doesn't mean that they're bad and it doesn't mean that they're unhealthy. It just means that you're having a reaction to something and maybe to be curious about that would, would yield a better result than judging yourself for it. Mm. Yeah. Or another. And so when, when people are feeling um, angry in moments like these, how can they deal with the anger without affecting others within their lives? That's a good question. I know a lot of people are living in close quarters these days. So I don't think that it's, that, it's really, I don't think it's entirely realistic to think that when we're angry, it's never going to affect other people mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form. I think it's, you know, we're human beings, we are perfectly imperfect. And so sometimes those things will happen. But ultimately, and ideally, I think the goal would be to try to recognize when somebody, you know, recognize when you're angry trying to sit on your own. Um, and I would say I'm just speaking to an adult audience now, so yes. it would be different, you know, for kids. But as adults, we, I, I think um, it's important to try to check in with yourself and ask yourself those questions. Like, what is going on for me? What am I feeling right now? What are the, th the things that have led me to feel this way? How can I best take care of myself given that I'm feeling this way? What does that mean I need to do? Does that mean I need to sit quietly and listen to some calming music? Does that mean I need to write out my feelings so I can better understand them? Does that mean I just need to switch gears and distract myself because I don't even want to deal with this right now and I don't need to figure it out? Um, but being really mindful of what we're feeling and how we're feeling can then give us the, the um, empowerment to choose our response to that particular emotion, whether it's anger or isolation, et cetera. And, th and that's another point that that feeling of isolation is there something we can do to to help with the feeling of of isolation um i think um I, I hope i'm not disappointing in my response here but i think that given the amount of time we've all been in this i hope most people have really been utilizing the resources around um for example zoom as we are right here and now um, I know some people have taken it upon themselves to write letters um, and I send them in the mail. Um, just doing whatever we can to reach out and let people know also that we need to be reached out to, that it can't be a one-way street, but let people know you'd love to hear from them or you need to hear from them. Um, I know some people have found it really helpful to join online classes of one kind or another, whether it's learning a, an instrument or learning how to read music, for example, if you don't have an instrument available to you. Um, doing online exercise classes, online yoga, meditation, things like that, book clubs online. Like use, I think, thank goodness we have the internet right now because it's really um, can be a savior for staying connected. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it definitely 
I, I say that regularly. It's, it's, it's thank goodness for, for the internet. Um, so, yeah. and, and if we are in the middle of like feeling that anxiety um, related to this whole situation, is there sort of little breathing tricks or mantras or anything like that mm -hmm. we could also use? Sure. Um, that's a good question. And I experienced actually that a lot, um, both personally and in others that I know, because mm. Here, for example, we have more mobility than you are all experiencing. So we can go out and do some things and some people choose to do more so than others. But inadvertently, um, people do experience situations where they're wondering, oh my gosh, did I just expose you know, myself to COVID? Am I now at risk? What's going on? Mm -hmm. um, or you hear somebody that you know who has it and it's, it just rises, raises everybody's anxiety. So in those situations, um, again, I think it's really important during a time like this, instead of where reactivity is sort of knocking on the door, it's more important to notice the feelings, check in with yourself, sit with those feelings, and then take stock of the facts around you. So take stock of, okay, um, if I fear that I was just accidentally exposed to somebody who was sick, take stock of well how far like how long was the duration of our contact how close were we were we wearing masks um when was this person positive am i even sure that they tested positive um how maybe they tested negative and i don't know so do you need to gather more information but trying to take stock of the factual information around you and let that inform you and see how that can educate your own anxiety around whether that means you actually don't need to be as anxious as you are or okay, maybe you do have a legitimate reason and you want to follow up by getting a test in the next couple of days um, and limiting your exposure to others in the meantime. Um, but again, the anxiety is just like in the example of anger, it will pass. Even though these feelings sometimes feel like they're never going to pass and they're the only thing that exists for us at that moment, uh, it's really important to remember that they'll pass. They may come back again, but then <laughs> they will pass. And trying to ask yourself, what can, what do I need right now? Do I just need to talk to a friend? Do I need to reach out to a family member? Do I need to just sit quietly? Do I need to, you know, shed some of this anxiety by doing some exercise at home right now and just kind of getting it out of my system? Um, yeah, so I think taking stock of the emotion and asking yourself, well, what would be helpful to me in this time, given that I'm feeling this, what's available to me? Yep, no, that sounds good. All right, so, so back to the ultra running and you were saying it's a little bit different <clears throat> when you're in a race and it feels like it's never going to end because cognitively you know it will and you actually can, you know, mm -hmm. say I've got X amount of kilometres or miles to go. Um, so how, when we're in that race situation, how do we deal with that? When we feel like, oh, it, it's so far, I don't, I, I don't know how it's going to end and you almost want to give up. How do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Um, that might be a little harder to answer in some ways, because I think, at least in my work, I really tailor things to the individual so much. So mm -hmm. to answer that more easily, it would be helpful to know what are, that, what are the specific situations that are relevant to the individual that I'd be working with. Um, prior to any event, for example, I help an athlete develop process goals. And those process goals are things that they can control in a race, whether that's their thought patterns or something as simple as how often they are hydrating and refueling um, or how they're, you know, going to keep, uh, keep tabs on, for example, their stride, their posture, their form while they're running. So we choose throughout the duration of the event, whether it's triathlon or an ultra or marathon, whatever, whatever the event is, choose some process goals that that person then will commit to executing as best they can. So hopefully, you know, if somebody, I mean, people are aware that, yeah, it's common in the last X amount of kilometers to feel a certain way that it's never going to end. Hopefully we have addressed that preemptively and then I can give that person those um, skills or or help them shift their mindset so that they're focusing not on how far they have to go but actually what they need to do in order to execute as best they can to get to that finish line um process goals are really helpful because it keeps your focus on the here and now whereas if you are focused on the outcome you're only thinking about what's so far in the future and especially in an ultra it's really far in the future um, and as you fatigue as you're saying obviously it's going to feel even more so in the future so 
I find process goals to be really helpful because it keeps somebody present minded, present focused. And if you're focusing as best you can on executing those process goals in the moment, then the outcome will take care of itself. But it's actually when you, if you focus on the outcome, it can also produce more anxiety and take that person more out of themselves. And so usually it does not lead to a better performance. So what I'm, I'm gathering from what you're saying is that um, <clears throat> before our races, we need to have a think about how we're going to deal with these sorts of situa situations. Mm -hmm. So do that ahead right. of time. Right. So for example, if it's an ultra trail run, you may know the last 10K, it's really steep uphill. So, you know, hopefully between myself and maybe working with a coach, we would strategize well, how, you know, how do you want to pace yourself through this event so that come the last 10K, we're setting you up as best as possible to execute as best as possible for the result that's, you know, with, with, within what we think you can do or even better. Yeah. Yep. And so do you think it would be beneficial for, for athletes to see a sports psychologist or is it only for elite athletes? No, I mean, I'm biased, of course, but I think it's, and, and, and my experience, it's been helpful for any level of athlete because we all get into sports for different reasons. And of course there's some similarities, but everybody has a different way in which they express themselves in their sport. And it's just very true that wherever you go, you know, that saying, wherever you go, there you are. Well, yeah. we're, whatever you, you know, we bring all of ourselves to the start line. So everything that, you know, you struggle with, everything that you thrive in, everything that you are, you're bringing with you to the start line. And so I have found it to be incredibly helpful to help an athlete hone in and focus on, well, where are their relative strengths? Where are their relative weaknesses? what's getting in the way of them having their best performances and consistent best performances. And then what do we need to do together to strengthen that individual to help them, you know, obtain those goals and do so in a sustainable way. Many athletes start off, um, you know, for example, if an athlete has early success in whatever their sport is, then they tend to get very confident. And as you get confident and you have results then you bump up to that next level of competition, Eventually, people are going to find themselves in, you know, being a small fish in a larger pond, unless you're like the elite, elite, elite. Um, and even then it's, you know, temporary. Yeah. But um, at some point along that journey, most athletes experience um, a shift where they go from feeling very confident because they're a big fish in a smaller pond to experiencing what it is to deal with pressure. And that turns into very commonly a sense of fear and people start running for example being afraid of failure being afraid that they're not going to continue to be able to sustain and put out the results that they have in the past running from a place of fear um, is not sustainable and so a large part of what i do is helping people shift that around so that they're not running away from something like the fear of failure but they're running mm -hmm. towards what they want and what they're running towards what they're capable of um, and that is more empowering for people and so then that also leads to better and happier athletes, better results, happier athletes. Yeah, no, no doubt. A lot of us think that we are, are stuck kind of in our own mental ways of approaching things. Is it easy or hard to change the way people approach their races? Like you're saying, moving towards something rather than running away mm -hmm. from the fear of not doing well or whatever right. it is. Is it a difficult process? <clears throat> I think that really varies a lot. Um, mm -hmm. In my experience, since most of my clientele are professional elite athletes, I find them to be among the very best and quickest to adapt and implement, mm -hmm. which is really thrilling and fun to watch. Um, but by the time they come to see me, usually they're extremely ready for change and wanting change. And they're also very good at executing, which is partly how they got to be so successful as athletes. So um, my experience has been that, that at that level, people are really quick to change um relatively speaking and that maybe uh, recreational athletes are a little bit more on the fence or hesitant and protective of the current style of functioning that has worked for them up to that point and so they may be curious about sports psychology but they may not really um have the same kind of motivation for one thing it's not their career their their you know financial lives are separate um so they may be a bit slower to um, have the same kind of motivation to, to change. 
yeah. um, not always, but sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. Now, um, just sort of off topic a bit, but we hear a bit about flow and that sort of thing. Can you maybe explain a bit how, how that sort of, what that terminology means and how we might sure. find flow? Sure. Um, so the concept of flow was originally um, flushed out by an author whose name I always butcher. <laughs> so excuse me, but it's uh, something like Chizimlinski, <laughs> something, and I can't even spell it. But you can Google it. Um, oh, Google I just it. have a really hard time saying that. <laughs> I, I have seen it too. Anyway. But, um, yeah. <laughs> um, and the concept of flow is a beautiful it's a beautiful one. And for those athletes that experience a sense of flow, it's unmistakable and it's a beautiful experience. I personally have experienced that many, many times. However, what's misleading is that people then can start to think that their performance is based on whether or not they can get into a state of flow. And research has shown that that's not true. You can be very far, from, you can feel very disjointed. You can have a bunch of different kind of quality qualitative descriptions to your event, but still put out an extraordinarily impressive performance. But the concept of flow just makes things feel really good, you know, and it is as it describes, you just feel like everything is clicking and you're, you're almost like you're at the same time completely there. You're also not there because you don't feel the circumstances around you as much. You're just so in the moment that things just seem to be almost effortless. Um, so I don't personally put too much focus um, on whether or not someone can achieve a state of flow or, or I don't necessarily think that that's a goal to have if it happens and that's great, but I certainly wouldn't encourage an athlete then to go chase it because as soon as you try to chase it, it's never going to happen. It's more of something that just when you're doing your thing, you may experience that state. And if you do enjoy it, it's wonderful. Um, but I see it as just like a bonus. It's not, it's not, um, something yeah. to think you have to have every time you compete. Yep. No, that's, that sounds good. Um, so if someone is always feeling like they, they love their training and they love entering races, but as the race approaches, they feel more and more anxiety and it's almost putting mm. them off racing. Um, how can, but they know they want to race. It's just the anxiety. How, how do we deal with that? Yeah. Um, that's a really common scenario yeah. that so many athletes experience. Um, there's a lot of different ways to approach that. And I think on the front end of things, so like far in advance of an event, if possible, I would start working with somebody around what are the things that they're afraid of? What, where's the anxiety coming from? Is it that they're afraid they're going to be judged by others? Are they judging themselves? Usually it's a combination of both. Yeah. Um, do they feel like it's a waste of time if they don't get a certain result? And it can be so many different things. Um, most of the time, it's just a fear of not doing well enough and disappointing, feeling disappointed. Um, so um, I'm trying to think of how to address, you know, how would I, is your question more how I would work with that or how? Um, well, just, just um, I mean, how someone could, is there any little things they could do to sort mm -hmm. of, help themselves, you know, some of the listeners listening yeah. to this maybe who can't get to see a sports psychologist yeah. or, you know, what, is sure. there any little things they could do? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. So, uh, you know, people, there's a lot of people who do love to train mm. and they're training for an event. As you said, one of the easiest things I think is to remind people that the, the race itself is a chance for them to just put on display all of their hard work. It's a chance for you to go to this event rested because you've tapered for it, hopefully, and just do your thing. Just do represent in this, you know, four hour, five hour window, whatever the event is, the best of what you can be given, you know, do respect the training that you've put in by giving your best performance that you can. So for all those times that you got up early in the morning to do your workout, all those times you really didn't feel motivated, but you did it, or when you were pushing yourself, or when you felt really good, but your coach said, no, you need to rest now, and it's hard, and you, so you rest because you want to be professional or you know, appropriate about your training, then do your best to honor all of those months of training by giving yourself the best chance you can to succeed on race day. 
and try hard um, to be in the moment. And every time you fast forward your thoughts, bring yourself back to right now. If you find yourself rewinding and being living in the past, bring yourself back to right now. And if you can, because that's probably what's happening when they're training under less pressure, yeah. that they're just enjoying and, you know, enjoying the moment of what it is. Maybe not the whole time, all the time or every day, but for the most part. So if you can bring some of that to your race and keep, I use the expression, keep your finger on the play button. You know, like we have, if you look at, you know, <laughs> any kind of um, audio device, it'll have the play, fast forward and rewind button. I just say, keep your finger on the play button. No reason to think about what's ahead or what's behind. When the race is done, you'll have plenty of time to go back to your regular way of thinking. So just put all that on pause for now. Um, suspend all your thoughts about other responsibilities and jobs and family and all those things and use this as a window to just really express yourself as best you can, giving respect to the training you've done. Mm, no, that I hope good. that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, so do you have any sort of final words on, on how we can use exercise or sports to, to help with, with our, um, with a positive mindset and, and, and just dealing with life? Yes. So there's an abundance of research showing the value of exercise, um, not just physically, but on mood. Um, and that is so well established at this point in time that really we all need to be accountable to ourselves and to those around us by getting some exercise more often than not, more days than not, whether that's gentle passive exercise because you decide you want to clean your house and so you're getting exercise that way, or if it's a more structured circuit that you can do from home, um, or including walking and running or biking within the 5k limits that you have currently, it really does need to be prioritized um, and, and be made a commitment because of the benefits to our mood as well as our physical well-being. Um, and now I lost of your question <laughs> again. I'm very sorry. I just got um, caught up in that. Yeah, no, no, no. Just sort of what, what we... I've, I've lost it now too. Um, how we can <laughs> how we can use exercise to to improve our sense of well being and our and our um yeah you know our, our, yeah. our develop positivity and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Well, I think one of the things about the pandemic is that it makes us vulnerable because we lose sight of our goals. You know, whether it's races that we were looking forward to are now cancelled and we don't have anything on the calendar in the future. So it really charges us all with the responsibility of coming up with some tangible goals that we can do to keep us somewhat focused. Some people need goals more so than others. You know, some people can just say, I'm going to run on the treadmill every day for 30 minutes and I'll be, you know, that's my thing. But others really need to have a goal. So I think being creative and saying, okay, I'm going to try to just, for example, challenge myself to see how many push-ups I can do, or I'm going to solicit my partner and and we're both together going to commit to doing push-ups and sit-ups and see, you know, create a game about it so that it's fun. You have a partner who's accountable as well. Um, set a date like, okay, by November 30th, we're going to see how much we've improved in the amount of sit-ups and push-ups that we can do um, or planks or, you know, whatever it is. So that in lieu, or in lieu of having a race calendar, you're saying, well, here's something I can control. Here's something I can express myself through self-agency. I feel motivated. It's tangible, not too far out in the future. It's measurable. All of those things, which can give help break up the time of a seemingly never ending lockdown. <laughs> no, that sounds good. And, and I think, um, yeah, that's what we kind of need to focus on at, at this moment. Well, thank you very much yeah. for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, I'm sure people sure. will find it very helpful. Um, so. Is there any way people can, um, do you do any sort of online sort of stuff or is there any way people can get in contact with you? Sure. Well, I can do some consultations um, online, but I also know, uh, for example, in Australia, there's a really nice network of sports psychologists that I also um, can help people access and yeah. find resources in their, you know, in the near city. Um, so certainly people can reach me via email. Um, my email is just my first and last name at Gmail. So Julie Emmerman at gmail.com. Yeah. Um, I have neglected my website, so you can look <laughs> at my website, but it's the educational piece is there, but honestly, I haven't touched it in so long. I do use LinkedIn more so people can access, um, connect with me via LinkedIn. Yeah. And also I have more recent podcasts and other articles up there that I've done. Um, 
So people are welcome to view those things and reach out. Um, and again, I think also like reaching out to the, maybe the nearest universities there um, is a good place to start if someone is looking to meet with somebody locally, even if it's through online right now, looking forward with, a, with optimism that the pandemic will someday end, then that person can also hopefully meet with um, that professional in person in the future. No worries. Yep. All right. Well, thanks so much. I'll put your email in the show notes. And um, once again, thank you very thanks. much for your time. Sure. Thanks for having me. It's fun to talk and it's really nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>